Good morning. I want to welcome you to Christ Community Church. I'm hoping you had a wonderful Thanksgiving. Uh, no, I know we did. We're, we've been trading the stomach bug, but between all that, we've been we've been we've been eating and feasting and having a good time. Um, my name is Stephen Watson. I'm one of the pastors here. If you're visiting with us today, we're so thankful that you're with us. Uh, we would be really appreciative if you would fill out a welcome card. Uh, the welcome cards are located outside this door in the corner of the hallway. And if you would just fill it out, put it in the black box. What we do with those is, is we just add you to an email list to receive our bulletin. That bulletin is, has all of our upcoming events and information. Also, you get an email about who we are and what we're about as a church. And you're like, man, I don't want to subscribe to something else. If you get that, you can also unsubscribe. Very easy. You just hit a button at the bottom and it's there and it's done. Uh, but we'd love to do that. We'd also love to meet you in person today if possible. Uh, another reason why it's good to get those emails is we are thinking that next week might be the week. Might be the week. I know I, it's like, Stephen, the, the sky is falling now. Uh, it's like I've cried wolf too many times. Uh, but the building inspection across the street at our new church has passed. And the fire marshal kind of came through. And... Uh, and only added like nine things for us to do. And we got those done by Wednesday. And he's like, we'll see you on Monday. And so it might be on Monday or Tuesday we get word. Uh, or they might find something else. I don't know. Uh, we were ha having discussions like, do we move everything we store at the Y across the street to the new facility or not? And we're like, oh, man, that would be like a new level of disappointment if we did. <laughs> It's like, we'll just wait. Um, but uh, we, w we might be at the new church across the street next Sunday. If we are, we'll send out an email. So another good reason to get those emails is we'll send out a special email letting you know where we're going to be worshiping next week if we get word. If you don't hear from us, it means we're back here, uh, which we're very grateful for the YMCA, YMCA for a great place to worship. Uh, a couple other an announcements. Uh, on Saturday... Well, one, on Saturday, we have a members meeting in the morning. So if you're a covenant member from 9 to 11, we have a meeting uh, at the church house. Occupancy or no, we'll have that meeting across the street there. Uh, and then if we do get occupancy, that evening we'll have a night of prayer and praise, uh, a service to dedicate that facility. But don't forget to put those on your calendar. We are in a season of Advent. Advent is when we celebrate the coming of Christ as a baby in the manger, when the Word of God put on flesh and dwelt among us. One of the ways that we celebrate Advent is as a church, we light a candle, and each candle lit represents a different, uh, a different attribute of the Christmas of the Advent season. We celebrate hope, joy, love, and peace and so this week we've lit the candle of hope. So we're going to do a responsive reading this morning on our sermon text today. So if you would, please stand and I will read the section that says leader. You can read the part that says congregation. In the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him, nothing was made that has been made. In him was the life, and that life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, but the darkness has not understood it. There came a man who was sent from God. His name was John. He came as a witness to testify concerning that light, so that through him all men might believe. He himself was not the light. He came only as a witness to the light. The true light that gives light to every man was coming into the world. He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, and his own did not receive him. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision, or of a husband's will, but born of God. The Word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only, who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. 
Christ Community Church, for our call to worship, we have Isaiah chapter 9, verses 2 and 6 through 7. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. The light has dawned on those living in the land of darkness. For a child will be born for us, a son will be given to us, and the government will be on his shoulders. He will be named Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. The dominion will be vast, and his prosperity will never end. He will reign on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and sustain it with justice and righteousness from now and forever. The zeal of the Lord of armies will accomplish this. Let's sing together. How great the chasm that lay between us how high the mountain I could not climb. In desperation, I turned to heaven and spoke your name into the night. Then through the darkness, your loving kindness Tore through the shadow of my soul. The work is finished, the end is written. Jesus Christ, my living hope. Hallelujah, praise the one who set me free. Hallelujah, death has lost its grip on me. You have broken every chain. There's salvation in your name. Jesus Christ, I live in Imagine so great a mercy. Who could imagine so great a mercy? What heart could fathom such boundless grace? The God of ages stepped down from glory to wear my sin and bear my shame. Cross has spoken, I am forgiven. The King of Kings calls me his own. Beautiful Savior, I'm yours forever. Jesus Christ, my grip on me. You have broken every chain. There's salvation in your name. Jesus Christ, my living hope. Then came the Seal the promise, your very body began to breathe. Out of the silence, the roaring lion declared the grave had no claim on me. Let's sing that one more time. Then came the morning. I seal the promise your buried body began to breathe and out of silence the roaring lion declared 
for the storms that we endure. Christ, the shore of our salvation, ever faithful, ever true. shall never be removed. Go ahead and have a seat. Our passage for our prayer of confession comes from Isaiah chapter 50, verse 11. The prophet speaks, Look, all of you who kindle a fire, who encircle yourselves with torches, walk in the light of your fire and the torches you have lit. This is what you will get from my hand. You will lie down in a place of torment. The prophet Isaiah is talking about how oftentimes what we do in our lives is that we light for ourselves torches. We, we are standing in the place of God saying that we can give light. We can give purpose. We can give direction in our lives. And the prophet reminds us that whenever we live life in this way, it leads to torment and it leads to destruction. So let's take the next few moments and prayerfully uh, lift up our our sins to God. The prophet also said, Who among you fears the Lord and listens to his servant? Who among you walks in darkness and has no light? Let him trust in the name of the Lord. and Let him lean on his God. Heavenly Father, we do confess that we have tried to be our own light in this world. We have reached for different things to give ourselves hope, to give ourselves purpose, to give ourselves pleasure. In disregard to your word and how you've called us to live, Lord, we have done this. And we confess our sin to you. But Father, we do love you. We thank you for your son, Jesus Christ, who died that we might be pardoned. So help us, O Lord, to walk in his light, to trust in your name for life and for death. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Having prepared our hearts through the confession of sin, being reminded that we are forgiven in Christ, our hearts are now prepared for the Lord's table. We gathered around the Lord's table on a weekly basis. Jesus said, as often as you gather together, you should celebrate this meal in remembrance of me. So what we do when we come to the Lord's Supper, we take a little piece of bread, we take a small cup of juice, and it is a representative meal. For Jesus and disciples, it was looking back to the Passover meal, where God delivered the Israelites from their slavery. For us, the same. We look back and we remember that we are delivered from our sins through the sacrifice of Christ. But it's also something else. It's also looking forward to another meal that we will celebrate in the kingdom. The meal that is a marriage feast of the Lamb, where we will celebrate being with Christ, being with God in heaven. So it is a time of celebration for us, remembering what Christ has brought us out of, but also what he is bringing us into. This meal is for anyone who puts their hope in in Christ. So if you are a Christian, it doesn't matter if you're a member of Christ Community Church or not, we invite you to participate with us. However, if you don't know Christ, we ask that whenever we bring the elements to you, 
You just say, not today, Pastor. There's no shame. There's no embarrassment in that. Uh, we just ask that you do this for your own self. Because by taking this cup, by taking this bread, you are saying, my hope in life and in death is in Christ. And I submit my will to his. So if that's not you, we just ask that you let it pass by and we'll say a prayer for you. Scripture teaches us that on the night that Christ was betrayed, he was with the disciples in the upper room. Christ took the bread, he blessed it, he broke it. He said, this bread re represents my body, which is broken for you. In the same way, then Christ took up the cup. He said, this cup represents my blood, blood of a new covenant, blood which is shed for the forgiveness of many sins. Christ Community Church, as often as we eat this bread and drink this cup, we remember Christ until he comes again. So let us eat and drink with thanksgiving. passage today comes from John 1, 1 through 5, 
and 10 through 14. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. All things were created through him, and apart from him, not one thing was created that has been created. In him was life, and that life was the light of men. That light shines in the darkness, and yet the darkness did not overcome it. He was in the world, and the world was created through him, and yet the world did not recognize him. He came into his own, and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, he gave them the right to be children of God. To those who believe in his name, who were born, not of natural descent, or of the will of the flesh, or of the will of man, but of God. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. We observed his glory, the glory as the one and only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you, Jim. I don't know if you have this memory. You're going to age yourself probably here. Um, But whenever I was a child, around this time of year, I got the best gift in the mail. It wasn't wrapped. It wasn't in a box. It wasn't a bow. It actually wasn't a gift. It was the potential of gifts. Do you remember getting like the J.C. Penney's and the Sears catalog? And it was the best thing in the world. I mean, this thing was like three inches thick, half filled with toys. It's like my brothers and I would fight over this catalog because we'd all like to take this catalog and and hover over every page, circling everything that we wanted. It's so sad now to watch my kids do that with like homeschool uh, catalogs, which is it's just not the same. That's not that's aren't real toys. Um, but but anyways, that, that, there is this idea that we would do this and we'd hand it to our parents with our initialed circle so they could know what each one of us wanted. Why? In the hopes that they would get us what we wanted. There is the hope that was there. I would like to say that that we tend to grow up. And we grow out of that as we get older. But the truth of the matter is we've just switched the Sears catalog to an Amazon wish list. And we still kind of have that list of things that we want to now give ourselves. But we always have this hope that if I could get this one thing, I would be happy. I would like this. And I think when we look at our lives today, we're always searching for something to have hope in. And I think we're searching for something to have hope in because we realize that there's something lacking. We realize that there's something missing. We realize that there's something broken. We realize that there's something not right about our lives and about the world that we live in. And so we all seek for hope. We all seek to light our own fires, as the prophet Isaiah said in chapter 50. Some of us put our hope in our identities. We put our hope in our careers. We put our hope in our health. We put our hopes in our politics. If only this politician or that politician would win, then things would get better. We put our hope in science, that if we could just get the right medication, the right pill. We put our hope in the right technology, that there ought to be an app to fix this problem. Surely there's an app, some type of technology where this is no longer a problem. And I think we have a hard time realizing that as long as we live in this world, there's always going to be brokenness, and there's always going to be sin. And the Bible highlights this from the pages of Genesis to the pages of Revelation, that there is a need for hope in this world, but that there's a need for hope in this world because of sin and because of the curse of sin. That when Adam and Eve rebelled against God in the garden, their rebellion was then birthed into every human heart. That we all want to resist against God. We all want to push back against God. And we all want to live life on our own terms, 
according to our rules, according to our hopes, according to our desires. And we find that that's true not only of ourselves, but we also see that this sin and this brokenness has seeped into everything around us, that nothing is how it ought to be. From our hearts to creation itself. Romans chapter 8 verse 20 says that all of nature has, sub, has been subjected to this futility under the curse of sin. Our passage today in the Gospel of John chapters 1 verses 1 through 14 talks about the hope that we have. And I want to pull out two truths from these 9 to 14 verses. And these two truths point to the fact that our hope has to come from beyond us and that to receive that hope, we have to receive Christ. First of all, our only hope has to come from beyond us. Let's read those first few verses again. John chapter 1, verses 1 through 5. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning, and all things were created through him. And apart from him, not one thing was created that has been created. In him was life, and that life was the light of men. That light shines in the darkness, yet the darkness did not overcome it. John tells us that Jesus Christ, the word of God, the light of the world, put on flesh and he dwelt among us. This is John's way of saying that there is hope from the world or hope for the world, but that hope has to come from beyond ourselves. We need to realize that whenever we are putting our hope in something other than Christ, we're playing a dangerous game. And it's a dangerous game because whatever we put our hope in apart from Christ can be taken away. I remember I, I had a neighbor one time. It's a great neighbor. Um, he had two dogs, Barlow and Bailey. I love those names of these massive German shepherds. Um, but the, his name was his name was Josh, and Josh was just an in shape dude. I mean, he's like Irish American, red head, ripped. Had his home gym. Every time I drove down the road, if he was home, that garage door was up, and he was working out. Uh, but but Josh had a problem, and his problem was that he was getting older. Uh, and when you get older, things just stop working the way they're supposed to work. And and not only that, you just like never hurt yourself in like an awesome way. Like you like to say, I hurt myself. I was lifting the car off of this off of this pregnant woman, I saved her life, and I saved the life of the child, and then I delivered the child, and then I got hit by a car, and it really hurt. But it's never that way, right? I think the last time I threw out my back, I was picking up a piece of trash. Um, but Josh, the epitome of health, one day was walking up a hill, and his knee blew out. He wasn't lifting a heavy weight. He wasn't saving a child. He was walking, and his knee blew out to the extent that his knee needed surgery, and he was on crutches for months. And I remember talking with him in my front yard. And when I was talking to him in my front yard, he said these words. He said, Stephen, it feels like my identity has been taken away from me. Why? It's because... He found so much of his identity of being the one who was healthy, who was strong, who was in control. And all those things with one walk up of a hill were t was taken away from him. And I remember talking with him in our front yard. And I said, listen, it's kind of a dangerous thing putting your hope in something that can be taken away from you. I said, what could you put your hope in that couldn't be taken away from you? And he was an amazing father. I can't remember. I remember the names of his dogs, but I can't remember the names of his kids. Um, he's an amazing father, very engaged with his kids. And he said, well, you know, I, I guess I could put my identity 
and being a dad. I thought, man, as, as noble as that is, it very well could be that your kids are taken away from you as well. Not only that, it could be that you dedicate your life to being a good dad and then your kids reject you as they grow up and move out of your house. There is a danger in putting our hope in anything, in anyone apart from God. Our hope for this life, our identity in this life must come from someone and something that is beyond us, something that is eternal. And that's how this passage describes Jesus. In verse 1, it says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He is saying that Jesus is eternal. Jesus is God himself. And when we put our hope in Christ, we are putting our hope in someone who cannot be taken away. We are putting our hope in someone who will not disappoint us in this life. All other things can be taken away. All other things can be destroyed. But the word of God, Jesus, is eternal. And he is sure and he is steady. It says that all things were created through him. When we look at the book of Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3, not only were all things created through Christ, But it also says that Jesus sustains the world through his word. Our hope has to become has to come from outside of us, from beyond us, from God. It describes Jesus as the word, but it also describes Jesus as the light. Look at what it says here in verse four. In him was life and that Life was the light of men. That light shines in the darkness, and yet the darkness did not overcome it. Jesus is light. In John chapter 8, verse 12, Jesus said, I am the light of the world, and anyone who follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. So to put our hope in Christ is to put our hope in someone that the darkness cannot overcome. Think about that. Earlier when we said that whenever Adam and Eve rebelled against God, how sin seeped into every human heart, how sin seeped into every aspect of creation, then think about what the Gospel of John says about Jesus, that the light shone into the world and the darkness could not overcome it. It's almost like when Jesus was born, that baby in a manger, and throughout his life, that the darkness was trying to overcome him, that darkness was trying to creep in, that the darkness was trying to stain him. But the whole time, Jesus, pure, eternal, strong, was able to not only resist the darkness, but overcome the darkness. Our problem, though, is that too often times, We love the darkness. That's what the Bible says in the Gospel of John, chapter 3, when John writes this. This is a judgment. The light has come into the world, and people love darkness rather than the light because their deeds were evil. For everyone who does evil hates the light and avoids it so that his deeds may not be exposed. But anyone who lives by the truth comes to the light so that his works may be shown to be accomplished by God. I think this is a truth that we all need to hold on to. Jesus, the light of the world, came into the world to expose darkness, to overcome darkness. And if we want any part of Jesus, then we have to come to grips with our own darkness. We have to come to grips with our own sin. We cannot fully accept the good news of Jesus Christ without having an understanding of our own brokenness. It's the sick that need a doctor, not the healthy. It's the sick that need healing, not the healthy. We need to come to grips with our own sin. 
in order to receive, in order to know, in order to be in the light with Christ. I think there's a danger here for people who sometimes have been a Christian for a while, especially those of you grew up in a Christian home. If you grew up in the church, this might really kind of point toward you and your heart. Because I think sometimes we get to this position in our lives where sometimes it's like we can't even see the sin in our own lives. And we begin to think, I'm pretty good. And we begin to think, I, I'm, I'm pretty healthy. And, and to be honest, I, I don't see sin in my life. We can get this way if we grew up in the church. Sometimes we can get this way if we've been a Christian for a while. And let me tell you, brother and sister in Christ, this is a dangerous place to be. And if this is where you are right now, know this. You are much further away from God than you realize. Because the truth is that the closer we do get to the light of Christ, the closer we do get with intimacy with the Father, we should see more of our sin, not less of it. We need to allow the light of Christ to shine on us, to expose our sin whether we are first coming to Christ or have been following Christ for decades, we need to, like Paul, realize that we are the chief of sinners. Letting the word expose where we have sinned against him, where we've fallen short, not in order to beat ourselves up, not in order to think, I am the worst of people, because in finding the sin, by exposing it to the light, we gain more hope and more confidence in Christ. John chapter 8, verses 31 through 34, Jesus said this. Then Jesus said to the Jews who had believed in him, If you continue in my word, you really are my disciples. You will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. We are descendants of Abraham, they answered him, and we have never been enslaved to anyone. How can you say you'll become free? And Jesus responded, Truly, I tell you, everyone who commits a sin is a slave to sin. This conversation with the Pharisees continues, and Jesus ultimately says, You are children of your father, the devil. And he describes the devil as the father of lies. And that whenever Satan lies, he speaks his native language. So if you are in a spot right now in your life and you consider your life, and you think, man, I'm a pretty good person. I'm pretty holy. I'm pretty obedient. I think what Jesus would say, according to John chapter 8, is that you're believing too many lies. That you're believing in your own goodness. That you're believing in your own obedience. And Jesus said, if we can believe the truth, the truth will set us free. The truth that we have this great need for God the Father to shine the light on our sins so that we can believe in him. And when the light of Christ shines, when his word exposes a sin in our heart, it doesn't just stop with the sin. That when the light of Christ shines out into the world, not only is our sin exposed, but so is our suffering. One of my favorite psalms is Psalm 139. This is what it says in verses 11 through 13. If I say, surely the darkness will hide me, and the light around me will be night, even the darkness is not dark to you. The night shines like the day, and the darkness and light are alike to you. For it was not you who created my inward parts. For, for it was you who created my inward parts, and you knit me together in my mother's womb. What is the psalmist saying? The psalmist is saying, my, my pain is not hidden from you. I can't hide my, my pain from you, because even if I hide it in the darkest spots, you can see everything. Know this, if you are suffering today, either because of your own brokenness, because of the brokenness of creation, or if you're suffering today because of someone else's sin and they have sinned against you, 
This is the hope that we have, is that the light of Christ exposes that suffering to the eyes and to the hands of a healing Savior. And He can help you and He can heal you when you commit to Him. Isaiah chapter 9, verses 2 and 6 through 7 was our call to worship today. This is what it said. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. A light has dawned on those living in the land of darkness. For a child will be born for us. A son will be given to us. And the government will be on his shoulders. And he will be named Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. The dominion will be vast and its prosperity will never end. He will reign on the throne of his father David and over his kingdom to establish and to sustain it with justice and righteousness. From now on and forever, the zeal of the Lord of armies will accomplish this. That, saw, that, that, that prophet realizes that we live in a land of darkness where there is sin, but there is also great suffering. And the hope of the world comes from beyond us. It's not our own abilities. It's not our own intellect. It's not our science. It's not our technology. It is not our own, our own abilities to create pleasure. What it is, is it's outside of us. And to find hope in this life, we have to look to the child that was born to us, a Savior that was given whose name is Wonderful Counselor and Mighty God. Our hope has to come from beyond us. And so we have to ask the question, how is this hope received? And we might think, well, this, this is just for people who don't know Christ. But follower of Christ, brother and sister in Christ, this is for those who don't know Christ, but it is also true and real for us as well. That hope is found in receiving Christ. And just as we are reminded through communion on a weekly basis, we have to be reminded on a daily basis that we need to receive Christ anew. Look at what it says in verses 10 through 14. He was in the world, and their world was created through him, and yet the world did not recognize him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, he gave them the right to be called children of God, to those who believe in his name, who are born not of natural descent or the will or the flesh or the will of man, but of God. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. We observed his glory. The glory is of the one and only Son from the Father full of grace, full of truth. The truth is to receive hope. We have to receive Christ. But what we read in this verse is that many people will reject Christ. He said, though the world was created by him, the world did not receive him. And here's a truth that we need to hold on to as well, that whenever people reject Christ, others will be hurt. Whenever someone rejects Christ, someone else will be hurt. We can think about the, the birth narrative for this truth. Think about King Herod. King Herod heard the good news that Jesus was born, that a Savior had come, the Messiah had arrived. And what did he do? Herod, King Herod, rejected Christ. He rejected the Messiah. And what happened? An untold number of babies were massacred by him. When someone rejects Christ, others will be hurt. We've been in the book of Luke now for a, a good year. In fact, it's been a year now. Uh, we've been in the gospel of Luke for a year now. When we get back to Luke after the Advent season, we're going to be close to Luke chapter 13. And in Luke chapter 13, there's, this, there's a story of a crippled woman coming to Jesus on the Sabbath. And Jesus reaches out his hand. He sees her suffering, and he brings healing 
to her body. When the Pharisees see this, they reject Jesus and they get upset at Jesus because he healed on the Sabbath. And Jesus looks at them and he says, which of you, if you have an ox or a donkey that falls into a pit on the Sabbath, which one of you wouldn't stop what they're doing, get down that pit and rescue their animal? And Jesus said, how much more precious is this woman who's been crippled her whole life? How how much more precious is she than those animals? The Pharisees rejected Jesus And in their rejection, they were willing for someone else to live in chronic disability. When people reject Jesus, other people get hurt. If you are married, if you reject Jesus, if you resist Jesus in your life, you know who's going to get hurt? Your spouse. If you're a parent and you resist Jesus and you reject Jesus, you know who's going to get hurt? Your children. If you're an officer and you resist Christ and you reject Christ, do you know who's going to get hurt? Those whom you lead. If you're a teacher in a classroom and you resist Christ and you reject Christ, the people who will suffer are those in your classroom. Whenever somebody rejects Christ, it's not just damning their own heart, but it's also hurting those around them. We look at our own society, a society that has so many of its blessings based off of Christendom and the word of God. Whenever a society rejects Jesus, people are going to get hurt. And as we look at our society today, we can say that is so true. It's true at, at the, at, at the 30,000 view of our society, but it's also true in our lives. That when we reject Jesus, the people who are in pain oftentimes are those around us. Why? Because we reject the light. And I think we ask the question, why do we reject the light? And we reject Christ, we reject the light of Christ because we are unwilling to let go of the false hopes that we have set up. We're unwilling to let go of what we've built up in our lives to say this is what life is about. What is it in your life that you have built up and you say this is what's going to bring me hope? This is what life is about. I think one of the things that you can do is you can put yourself uh, and you can think about yourself and you think about your context and you can think about what other people in your same context put their hope in. So if you're a Christian soldier, don't think about yourself. Think, all right, what do other soldiers put their hope in? If you're if you're in college, you say, all right, what do other college students put their hope in? If you're in high school, what do other high school students put their hope in? Because what is true of of, of a context of people, of a group of people, is more than likely also possibly true for you as well. The problem is, is we can see their sin more easily than we can see our sin. We can see their false hopes more easily than we can see our false hopes. So as you think about where you find yourself in life right now, what do people generally in your context put their hope in. And then you have to ask yourself the same question. Am I putting my hope in the same thing? Am I unwilling to let go of what I'm trying to build up for my hope in this life? King Herod had his hope and power and authority. And when the Messiah, the true Messiah, arrived, he was unwilling to let go of his power and his authority. And so he was willing to let babies be massacred to hold on to it. The Pharisees had their hope and self-righteous accomplishment of the law, of being right in the eyes of people, of having and holding their position. They weren't willing to let go of that, so they were willing for a woman to live crippled. How might your chasing after a false 
hope be hurting the people around you? When the light of Christ shines, it shines in our lives. And what Christ is calling us to do is he says, let go of that false hope. Like the prophets in the Old Testament, cut down those idols, use them for firewood, and then serve the only true and living God. True hope is only found in Jesus Christ. So how do we receive him? We receive him not through natural descent or the will of the flesh or the will of man, but we receive him through God. We receive this hope of Christ through repentance and belief. Listen to what John said about about who can receive him. In verse 12, it says, But to all who did receive him, he gave them the right to be called children of God, to those who believe in his name. The same truth of how we enter the kingdom of God is the same truth about how we live in the kingdom of God through repentance and belief, from turning away from false hopes and turning to Christ, of putting our trust in Jesus' life, death, and resurrection, and his coming kingdom. How do we receive Christ? I was thinking about that question about how we receive Christ and the heart behind that. And I was thinking about the rest of the birth narrative of Jesus. How do we receive Christ? Through belief, through repentance. But also I think we receive Christ the way Mary received Christ. That when people told her who her baby was going to be, it says that she contemplated these things. That whenever... We receive Christ, we should receive Christ the way Elizabeth received Christ. That when a pregnant Mary walked into her presence, her unborn baby, Elizabeth's baby, John the Baptist, leapt in her womb, and she says, Who am I that the mother of my Lord should come to me? She received Christ with humility. We should receive Christ the way that Joseph received Christ. That though Jesus was not his natural descent, that he served as a father to this child, dutifully serving at great sacrifice to himself and his family. That we receive Christ the way the shepherds receive Christ, full of joy, full of excitement, sharing the good news with others. We receive Christ in this way. Christ Community Church. What is it we are putting our hopes in today? Because the true hope has to come from beyond us. And it has to come through receiving Christ. Let's stand and pray. Heavenly Father, we, we do praise your name. We praise your name that Christ came that he put on flesh and he dwelt among us, that he redeemed us and called us his own children. So, Father, may we always constantly be, be reminded of these truths to put our hope in him and not to things that fade away. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. O come, O come, Emmanuel, and ransom captive Israel that mourns in lonely exile Until the Son of God appears, rejoice, rejoice, Emmanuel, shall come to thee, O
Oh, come thou day spring, come and cheer our spirits by thine advent Disperse the gloomy clouds of night and death's dark shadows put to fly. Rejoice, rejoice, Emmanuel shall come to of all mankind bid thou our sad division see and be thyself our king of peace rejoice church remain standing for our benediction gospel of john said that the light has shone into the world and the darkness could not overcome it that same light dwells within you O man and woman of god so let that light shine this season proclaiming the hope that we have in christ you're dismissed